<laughs> for the next uh, uh, segment where I'm demonstrating the inductors and capacitors. Um, let me, I'm gonna stop sharing and I will move on to my um, the real equipment camera setup that's here. So let me stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna bring up my control thing so that, um, so I have a few different um, camera arrangement setup. So um, this is the setup that you will see most of the time for um, for the, the working with the circuits. I have um, my primary equipment here, the function generator that's gonna be my uh, time bearing. This is gonna be my AC voltage source. And I have the oscilloscope so that I can measure voltages at different places. And this is the place where I'm going to uh, set up circuits. And depending on what I'm displaying here, I do have a, a display with uh, the stuff here shown a little bit larger. And, um, and later on, when we are measuring uh, component values, we'll have a uh, um, LCR meter. I was trying to read this screen and it was uh, not quite readable enough, especially the really small letters that say uh, Milli Henry and things like that. So for that, we'll use this. Um, and there's a, one more part that's not quite on video. Um, which is, I do have, uh, so uh, maybe I can just point to it here. <laughs> uh, I, I am able to, uh, this overhead camera that I have, um, it doesn't move and uh, with it moving, I can set it up in such a way so that you see this um, um, these, uh, tower of components. Um, let's see, will it? Uh, that is so bright. Um, and yeah, those letters read upside down because I had to invert the video. Um, so, so I have components that are, um, so I have all the register values that I'll need. That's the, that's the stuff. I'm trying to rotate the set. It won't quite cooperate. Okay, uh, so I have all the register values that I'll need. That's the stuff here. And um, the selection for capacitors and inductors are, is a little bit less, but I do have uh, some selection of capacitors here. Um, I'll show you some of them. I think that's what I want you to demonstrate um, on camera. And I do have a set of inductors. And inductors, I don't, you know, they must sell them, but I have never actually bought inductors. I have only ever um, made my own inductors. So let me focus. I have only ever made my own inductors. So I'll um, talk, talk a little bit about these inductors. So, so uh, I guess uh, what I'm showing now is that, you know, I have this tower of components there. That's where I'll be pulling stuff from. And, um, but most of the time I won't be showing you the tower because it's a, really a big hassle to change this camera arrangement. So most of the time I'll just be, um, I'll, so, you know, when, when you hear the uh, noise of me pulling drawers and whatnot, <laughs> I'm pulling them from here and I'll put it on this overhead camera thing so that you can see it here. Uh, of course, let me just, uh, Lighten it a little bit. So I guess uh, maybe let me start out with the capacitors. That's uh, the thing that we kind of just skipped over um, or we didn't spend a lot of time with when we did the capacitors. And um, capacitors, capacitors come in very, a few different types. And so I'm pulling a few drawers here. This is a, uh, yeah, it, autofocus is gonna be a so This is a uh, capacitors that are in a smaller range, about 100 picofarad range or 0 0.1 nanofarad range. And let me pull something from about, um, I guess a few nanofarad range. So here's the capacitor um, that's labeled to at uh, yeah, 0 0.02 microfarad or about 20 nanofarads. And 
most of the really large capacitors are these um, electrolytic capacitors. So these are capacitors on the, uh, oops, it would be upside down. Uh, try to autofocus. So this is, uh, you know, uh, tens of hundreds of microfarad, and these are the well, okay, so that, these are the electrolytic capacitors. So they, they come in different shapes. Uh, there's a different chemistry and physics at play. Uh, and I think I have one more that uh, ah, um, I'm looking for. I guess, is it just the one? There are uh, ceramic capacitors. I guess maybe this one. Um, I think uh, my favorite kind used to be, the, well, I guess it still is this one. So this is one more type of capacitor. Um, so it's uh, on the order of about one microfarad range and um, they get one microfarad or so out of capacitors that are about that big. Um, I think this is a ceramic capacitor. Um, some of these other ones might also be ceramic capacitor. So, so th these are some <laughs> examples of capacitors. They uh, come in a wide variety. And I, I guess uh, when you're building circuitry with it, um, at the kind of first level, what you really care about is that, um, that uh, the capacitance of value that, that to, um, that's really the main thing you care about. And what I would tell you that you should watch out for when you are looking at capacitors are really two things. Uh, one is a uh, rated voltage. Some of the capacitors will say on them, uh, not this one apparently, let's see. <laughs> um, see if I can find one that actually lists it. Um, they might not, uh, in which case, Ah, okay, this one does. So let me see if I can show this one. Uh, uh, okay, might not auto focus. I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna move all this away. And let me zoom super in so that you can actually see the capacitor uh, better. All right. Uh, have a lamp. Oh, that doesn't help. Let me just to make it brighter. All right, so this is the writing that's on the capacitor. And I think you can barely, you can maybe barely see it um, there. <laughs> so that's the capacitor and uh, you can kind of barely see it. Um, it's, uh, sorry, I'm trying to, the distracting things on my screen. Um, it says 200 V. And what it's saying is that this capacitor has a rated maximum voltage of 200 volts. If you apply more than 200 volts, it'll uh, break down the material in there. It'll undergo uh, dielectric breakdown and it won't act as a capacitor anymore. So, but you know, most of the time, especially when you're building small circuit, uh, like regular circuits that 200 V, it's a higher than power line voltages. So um, that's just something that you would only worry about if you are trying to use this in a high voltage application. So, but, uh, so the voltage limit is one thing that you would uh, pay attention to and make sure that you don't exceed as you use those capacitors. And these electrolytic capacitors, I pulled the 47, microfarad one here. Let's see, can I show it? No, no. So super amplified. Okay. Um, Share the Twitter. Okay. It says 50V on it. Let me just turn it around a little bit. Yeah. It is, you can see 50 V <laughs> and uh, what it means is this has a 50 volt uh, maximum voltage rating. So same deal as with the other one, if you go above 50 volts, uh, it'll break the capacitor. Now this has some additional marking on it. So with this capacitor, it's, a, um, it's a symmetric as in, as you are looking at it, you wouldn't be able to tell 
uh, which side is which. Like if I just flip it around, nothing changes, nothing's different. With the electrolytic capacitors, they are polarized or they have a sense of polarity. There's a particular direction in which they have to be used. So it's indicated in two different ways. First, the legs are of different lengths. And um, because oftentimes when you're actually soldering circuit together, you will usually end up cutting off the legs to the right length. It has um, uh, marking on the side as well, indicating which lead. Um, so this lead here should be a lower voltage when you are uh, when you are working with it. So um, electrolytic capacitors come with some limitations. Um, so yeah, so it, it's something to be careful about when working with the capacitor. Um, so I think that's enough about capacitors. Um, let me go on and talk about inductors. Um, so with the inductors, we don't, uh, I'm pretty sure you can, let me just, I'm just putting the capacitors away. Um, I'm pretty sure you can buy inductors. I guess I just simply haven't tried buying them. What I do have are materials that you need to build inductors. So, and uh, so this is the lead that was cut out of the, sorry. <laughs> I got extra things I need to put away before I can fly this in. Um, so, so, you know, this semester we have a shortened lab schedule and when we had our full set of labs, we had the one where we did a kind of a transformer. And the, when you are trying to build a transformer, so you're, so I do lecture on mutual inductance and your textbook covers mutual inductance. And when you try to build um, uh, like a vacuum or air core solenoid, what you will find that is that the mutual inductance is very low. And uh, basically the signal from one um, solenoid to the other solenoid, it doesn't really couple well. Um, so when you are building an inductor, what you, or when you're building a transformer, what you need is a core that looks like this. Let me switch my camera. What you need is a core that um, looks like this and it's got special properties. I mean, so you can see that it's a toroid geometry. So that must be useful in some way. Um, you, it's one of the special geometries that we talked about in the context uh, with magnetic fields. And, um, and this uh, green looking thing, it's, uh, uh, if you're trying to buy it, it will be sold under the name of like ferrite core, ferrite. And it's because it's a uh, ferromagnetic. I have a magnet here and it sticks to the magnet. And um, so, you know, if that's all you want, you could have just the iron core um, as in just piece of iron ring uh, could work like uh, this, uh, uh, this green toroid thing would, but this is made in a special way. This uh, ferrite core, um, so it is made out of things that contain iron and nickel, but it's constructed in a special way so that it's not really conductive. Um, I, I don't know the exact way, but it's got mixed with the ceramic and stuff so that it doesn't quite conduct current. And what that does is it makes it more efficient because if you have a just a pure iron core, the magnetic field in the iron will induce current that will induce eddy current and um, that eddy current will dissipate energy. So uh, sometimes that's what you want, but in most times when you're building transformers and inductors that you will see me measure, that really isn't what you want because if, uh, um, if the, the ferro iron core of your inductor can dissipate energy, then um, ideal inductors are not supposed to dissipate energy. So, um, so these ferrite cores, uh, I got them so that we can make a transformers and or transformer models and inductors. And the uh, main thing that I've made with these that you will see and we will use today are inductors. 
I have a few that I saved from previous semesters. I have one. Uh, this is probably the one with the highest uh, inductance. I want you to see what's the highest uh, uh, value of inductance I could get for Physics 4B labs. So, so we'll use this one for one of the labs. And let me actually pick out a few now. Um, so, and I can kind of just uh, tell by the number of windings, which ones will have more or less inductance, just qualitatively. I, I, I hope you um, get that from what we covered uh, last week. So, uh, fewer, so same toroid geometry, but a smaller number of windings will, uh, what, what smaller magnetic field inside the toroid and it'll lead to less inductance. Uh, let me try to get something in between. Uh, do I have anything that's a smaller? I think this one might be a little bit smaller. Um, and I guess something in between would be this one. So let me have these four inductors set aside. And just because of the way um, these things work, <laughs> those will be the only four values that will be limited to, um, even though it'll be. Um, so yeah, so, so that's, uh, uh, these are the physical objects that are, um, that are capacitors that you saw earlier and inductors that you are seeing now. So, so I think that um, kind of covers what I had to cover in the sense of, um, in the sense of showing you what inductors are. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, demonstrating doctors and capacitors. Yeah, so it, <laughs> I just saw that's what they look like. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, and you will see me use them for the rest of this lab. So, so what I want to move on to is I want to move on to demonstrating some of the circuits that you saw in the simulation. And uh, so I have this uh, uh, simulation thing brought up. So that I can show. Um, let's see. How do I want to do this? Um, I think. Sorry, I didn't quite think this through. I think what I actually want to do is I want to use my virtual camera to um, um, show the simulation. So let me actually set that up now. Um, let's see. Um, I'll just uh, um, add. Uh, Add a window capture and uh, also scope simulation. I guess you can type in the, uh, I mean, you can't see the windows where I'm typing stuff in, but you'll, well, you'll see the uh, oscilloscope simulation thing quickly enough. Uh, I guess I wanted to capture cursor. Okay. So that's what you see. Let me just to make it a little bit smaller so that it doesn't take up the whole space. Uh, well, I mean, eh, it's okay if it takes up the whole space. Just wanna copy it a little bit and uh, let me put it into the one with the overhead camera. Um, and, and I'll figure out if I want to put it elsewhere too. So, so uh, this is what I was uh, playing with last time. And, um, and what I want to kind of confirm or um, show th this time is I want to uh, make sure that the results we got with the simulation, they, um, they work in real life. Because the thing about simulation always is um, maybe it's not programmed right. Maybe it's got bugs in it and it's very possible for um, what you see in the simulation not to be the uh, realistic thing. So, so I want to just uh, uh, do a, a spot check. So I think the last time we did the capacitor circuit and we also did a diode, but I don't have any diodes ready, so I can't do that. So let me set up how I remember setting this up last time. I think uh, I used this to demonstrate, um, uh, I, I used this to demonstrate a time dependent circuit. So let me do what I did uh, last time. Um, see here. Um, 
So I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna do so right now. Actually, with my uh, let me just <laughs> copy this over to the other screen and um, let's see. I think this is the view I want. So within this uh, real setup, real equipment setup, what I've already done is I connected the trigger output here or the TTL output into the trigger input of the oscilloscope. So I just did the exact same thing with the simulation oscilloscope. And um, what I did, well, so this that isn't the exact same thing we did the last time, but uh, what we did the last time that, I don't, do I need to go get a mouse? Um, I'm trying to control this with my uh, touchpad and it's a little bit harder. Okay, so I'm just gonna click it a few times to get to the <laughs> right place. So let me um, put an output from here into the input and put it on DC oh, and actually have some kind of an output that will show enough of a signal. Uh, I need to go to long enough of a time scale to, okay. Maybe I'll go a little bit faster here. Um, yeah, so I think that this is close to what I demonstrated last time. Let me just uh, put the signal from the oscilloscope into the circuit. And I'm going to measure the voltage across the capacitor. And and I did other things too last time, but um, we do, uh, the, this uh, redo of the simulation will leave this here for now. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oscilloscope settings are complex and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. I, I should have put it on dual, okay. All right. Um, yeah, so I think right now I'm a little bit Let's see. Um, so I have different options. I could either uh, have a, a you know, uh, actually, yeah, let me go, uh, let me make this uh, faster because I think that's gonna make a bunch of things easier. So, okay. Um, and and uh, instead of making it go even faster, I'm going to increase the capacitance value by a factor of 10, okay. So that's, uh, uh, that's what you saw last time. So, so with that in mind, uh, I will build the real circuit that, uh, that matches the circuit here and, and see if we can get the same thing in the, uh, with the real thing. So let me, let's see. I think while I'm building the circuit, it's probably better to be in this view, so. Um, so, so let me build a circuit here. I have uh, the usual breadboard. Yeah. So this is the thing you saw me use to, in order to, to build the circuits. And um, wow, those are so, I don't know if I want to use the same component values, but uh, let me give that a try and then I'll deviate later. Because our of uh, hundred ohm seems too low to me, but it's fine. Uh, I'll at least start there. So I have uh, what is it? It comes from a hundred ohm box, so um, I I could trust it to be hundred ohm. <laughs> but what I'm gonna do is to be on the safe side. Uh, let me let me uh, copy over the. Uh, sorry, not cut. L let me uh, let me measure it just to be sure. So I am copying over the um, the the screen thing for the uh, LCR meter, and let's see here, um, and uh, and I'll measure it. So you can't see the meter off on the side, but uh, it's there. Let me just move this thing over so that they are not so overlapping each other so much. 
and uh, let me just put this on the right mode to measure resistance. Oops. Okay. Um, I mean, it also, uh, well, anyways, uh, I'll show the other stuff when I'm measuring inductance. So this came out of 100 ohm box, and it probably is 100 ohm. I just don't want to be sure. And yeah, it's close enough to 100 ohm. And this time I'm not gonna be measuring precise component values because um, precision isn't, I, I'm not trying to get to the level of precision that we got um, that we got last time with the DC circuit analysis. So I need, a, so I have a register. And uh, as a reminder about how the connections are made in this breadboard, the on, along the power bus, connections are made uh, across horizontally to, across the whole thing. And all, for this regular um, inputs, <laughs> connection is made along the column um, up until this channel. Across the channel, the connection is made. So that's uh, what I'm using here. Let me just make it a little bit less bright. So bright. Um, so I need a capacitor. Let's see if I have a so thousand nanofarad. That's one microfarad. Um, I have, well, I have a 0.47 microfarad. I think that's the closest I can find. Uh, I have 0.47 and then point, uh, and then, and then point, uh, I mean, 2.2 .2 microfarad. So, this, wait, no, it says 22, ah, uh, here it is. Okay, so this comes out of, uh, uh, <laughs> let's see, let me hold it up here. Can I, will this work? So this comes out of uh, one of the boxes that are, it's not gonna work, okay. Let me put this down here, and I'm just gonna zoom in. Um, so, oh. I wish I had a Twitter. <laughs> I'm just using my fat fingers and it's not gonna quite work. Okay, I think you can read uh, 474. And um, because of the way the box is labeled, it should be 0 0.47. Uh, oh, the last four might actually be the power of 10. Well, we'll see. That's how it's labeled. So the capacitor labels are, labels are not, um, they're not standardized in any way. And it can be super confusing. It, um, so it's so as a rule, I always measure component values. And if you always measure component values, one upside is that you don't really care how these components are labeled because you are gonna measure what it is. So if it, if someone put it in the wrong box or um, or you misread the label, doesn't matter. You are gonna measure it and. Then you measure it, you will get what it is. So it says 400, yeah, yeah. So it's, um, um, yeah, so I think that's the correct one. Uh, that should be 0 0.433 microfarad. And um, what you will see is that, so this is technically labeled as a 47. And I want you to see that the capacitor values can vary quite a bit. 10% um, tolerance. Call for capacitors. So let me put this in here. So it'll be different from what we simulated by a factor of ten, and and that's fine. Um, well, so the way it's connected here. So I have this junction here that uh, um, where the capacitor and register are connected together, and I think that's my whole circuit. Uh, what I can do now is I can just uh, um, put signal lead into this connection here and signal lead into this connection and I can read the voltages out of them. So let me actually put in the wires so that it's easy to connect. Um, I'm gonna put one wire for signal connection here. This uh, is where we'll put positive voltage. And um, let me put in gray wire to the place where we will put in the negative voltage. And I'm really trying to color code it, just make it look a little bit different. 
Okay, let me zoom out here. Um, so, so that's my circuit. And uh, let's uh, switch over to here where we can actually put in the signals. Um, so I, I need to change this because uh, this is not the, let's see here. Uh, th this is not the, um, so it's right, this is the wire that's right now going into channel A and uh, that, uh, that's not what I want. <laughs> I want a signal that will go into my circuit. So what I need instead is I need to grab one of these uh, alligator clip uh, cables. So it's got one of these on the end and these on the other end. So I'm getting an output from the function generator. If I can. Plug it in. I didn't quite feel it click. Oh. Sorry, it's too far. Can't. All right. Okay. So that's now connected. And let me um, put this lid here. So I guess uh, in the thing, I'm using what? One kilohertz signal. So, oh, I guess I'm already on one kilohertz. So that's good. So I'll change the signal uh, shape after I'm done connecting. So I'm connecting uh, the, do I need to zoom out a little bit more. Let me, yeah, let me zoom out so that you can see the color of the leads. So this is the, um, the lower voltage, not quite ground yet, but, but the lower voltage, and this is the uh, higher voltage. And uh, because it's a function generator, you know, uh, sometimes lower and higher gets inverted. It's just purely for the purpose of label. So that's the signal going in, and I need to put um, uh, output from the circuit into channel A of the oscilloscope. So I have one more of these cables just for that. Let me put this here. And the oscilloscope will always ground um, wherever this lid is connected. So I do have to be careful here, especially if I want to match the simulation. So in the simulation, it looks like they grounded um, the junction between the register and the, so in the simulation, where's my, in the simulation, it looks like they grounded the junction between the, um, the can you, yeah, junction between the capacitor and the uh, register. That's where you see the outer portion of this connection connected. So that's what I'm going to try to ground here as well. So I'll put the black lead from oscilloscope, which will actually ground whatever it's connected. I'll connect that there and then connect, uh, uh, connect to this on the same. Well, I'll just click the alligator clips together. Okay. All right. So that should be it. Um, what happened to my signal? Oh, yeah. I guess both A and B. Um, oh, oh, yeah. So, so with the sinusoidal wave, you don't really see anything interesting. Let me switch it to a square wave. So with the square wave, um, that's what you see for A. And this, uh, wait, that is for B. Um, mm, um, let me just zoom in a little bit on the time scale. Mm, well, that is interesting. Um, so I'm looking at the B signal right now, and it should be square wave, and it's not. Let me just uh, try to see if I can figure out what's wrong with it. It's so possible that it's not even, oh, no. Mm, it's possible my function generator is grounded, the function generator. If it is, that's... Uh, Oh yeah, all right, <laughs> so that's gonna be the first difficulty. I think my function generator is grounded. 
So, um, so, so when I connected this uh, uh, ground lead to here, what I've done is basically short across the register. So that's why. <laughs> Okay, so uh, some things I can't quite do the exactly the same way as it's done in the simulation. So what I'll need to do is if I want to, so uh, uh, so if I want to measure the actual uh, voltage across the capacitor, then I'll have to reconfigure my circuit so that the ground lead is on one side of the capacitor because the grounds will always be connected, whether they're explicitly connected in the circuit or not. And I'll just connect it here as a reminder that ground is connected. And I'll, so I'll put the higher high voltage on the other side. So this is gonna invert what the picture looks like. It's fine. And you do see some uh, real world complications, which is that when this uh, function generator is trying to drive the this circuit, it cannot quite maintain that square wave output that it's supposed to. So, um, so we'll fix that soon, ish. So, um, so this is so um, as a kind of view here. Uh, this is the circuit. It's a kind of a little bit busy here, but um, I have I, I have um, the grounds connected to one side of the capacitor, and the um, the input signal connected to the other side the of the register for applying voltage across both elements in series, and I have the um, the oscilloscope input connected to the other side of the, I connect it to the register because it's easier to connect it that way, but it is connected to the other side of the capacitor by um, the breadboard connection. So, so let's see how that looks on the oscilloscope. Now uh, I need to put A back in. Okay, so it's uh, kind of starting to look similar to what you saw, um, uh, what you saw in the simulation. So um, let me see here. I'm gonna move this camera a little bit. Oops, um, did the wrong thing. Ow. So that's the signal from the real circuit. And um, in, the, in the simulation, it's... Uh, so you, you see the, um, the, the capacitor charging. And there are some corrections that I do have to make. Uh, one of them is that we are using a different value of capacitance. Our capacitance is smaller by a factor of two. So I can make the correction in two different ways. I can make it either by using a slower frequency, then I think everything will kind of scale. Um, slower, uh, dif well, different frequency. And I think if I want everything to look similar, then the frequency here has to be bigger by a factor of two. So I can do that. Let me go from one kilohertz. That's the signal here. I, at least I think it's one kilohertz. Let me just uh, double check. So it's time is on the scale of 0.2 milliseconds per division. I have, um, so from one full period, I have one, two, three, four, five divisions. So one millisecond period, yeah, that is one kilohertz. So that's what we are putting in. Let's move up to two kilohertz to see if the shape of the real signal will appear similar to the, um, to the simulated signal if it's at two kilohertz. Yeah, close enough for shape. Let me just change the time scale here so that I'm displaying about one full thing. Uh, 
I should change this the other way. Uh, let me just uh, slide it for um, proper translation, that change of <laughs> a perspective. Okay, that seems close enough. Let me just uh, zoom in on the Y scale. And so there are um, imperfections. I think it's easier to see the similarity if you <laughs> ignore the input signal because um, that's the imperfection that I can't quite <laughs> make it go away. Um, it's that my function generator isn't able to provide a sudden rise in voltage with that uh, capacitor in place there. Um, one day if it'll help. So one thing that is, uh, no, yeah. It, it, so if you're just looking at the output signal, so if you're just looking at channel two here, and just looking at channel A here, then it looks the same. <laughs> so, so that's a, um, yeah. So, so let me leave that there. And so that's a one way to correct for the difference in the capacitance. Another way I can correct for it is so I can keep this at one kilohertz, same frequency, and uh, increase the resistance by a factor of two because I think I have a. 200 ohm register here, some uh, I spoke to. So I don't have a 200 ohm register, but what I can do is I can put another 100 ohm register, another, oops, I can, let me just get rid of the simulation. I can put another uh, 100 ohm register. Let me just uh, measure it to be sure. So oh, I guess I can show it on the, camcorder that I'm connecting this. Uh, I can put another 100 ohm register in series with the uh, with the 100 ohm, uh, existing 100 ohm register. And uh, let me change the settings so it's actually measuring resistance. And um, so that'll get me 200 ohm. So let me put this in series and I'll need to change the connection here. So I'm just gonna, unplug this uh, connection that on the other side of the register. And I'm just gonna put this register so that it goes from the lead of the register that's already there and any other free column so that it, uh, I have two registers in, so this is so in the way. Um, so that I have two registers in series now and when I connect the signal input here, I'll have 200 ohm registers. Um, yeah, and now, oh, I see it, but you don't see it. Um, so now with the, uh, well, close to 100 kilohertz signal, uh, what you see there looks very similar to the oscilloscope simulation. And so that's another way to correct it. And I guess as I was doing this, I realized uh, I could also um, put more than one capacitor together to get a uh, value of capacitance that's not exactly available. So, so, so since I realized that, let me do that. Um, so what I can do, so, so let me go back down to 100 ohm register. So I'm gonna uh, put this away and put this connection back here. And you can add the capacitors in parallel if you want to add the capacitance values together. So I already have, um, um, so that was about uh, 0.43 microfarad capacitor. Let me get another, uh, what should be 0.4 something and measure it to be sure. So it'll come a little bit shorter than uh, microfarad uh, when they're added together. So this is, um, Oh, sorry, they touched. They should, the leads shouldn't touch. Um, so, okay, so added together, they'll add up to something like 830 uh, nanofarad or, yeah, so about 20% sure, but it'll be close enough. So this capacitor, I want to put it in, um, I want to put it in parallel with the existing capacitor. So I think what I can do is I can put it here. So one end of the connection will be at the same uh, junction with the register. I think, hope you can see that. 
and the other end, uh, you can't quite say, but you'll have to trust me that I'm putting in the right spot. Uh, so there. Um, so they are, they, they appear kind of parallel and they are electrically parallel. So with that, let's see. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, this is the signal you see. So compare it to the simulation. At least if you ignore the input, then it looks quite similar. And um, you can, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I'll leave that there. Uh, I want to show other circuits in the time that we have. You know, it is possible to get into um, kind of study or discussion of the, so the, what causes these imperfections in the input because when you are looking at it, um, so when I remove this capacitor here, the second capacitor, you will see that that input gets a lot better. It becomes more square-ish. And in fact, if I'm guessing right, I think uh, they look too better when we had 200 ohm resistance instead of 100 ohm. So let me remove this here and then put back on the other 100 ohm and get 200 ohm register here. Then if you try to remember what it looked like before, then this actually looks better than uh, what it was before. So, so, you know, when you are working with the circuits, there are these details that sometimes just pop up as you're working with it. Um, let me leave that there. Um, the, other, sir, the other thing I wanted to uh, demonstrate that you saw in simulation was, um, was the, the ringing circuit. So let me uh, reset that up in the simulation and, uh, and, um, and we'll try to do that ringing circuit with the real thing again. So that was with the resonant circuit because you need both the inductor and capacitor to do that. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll just have to set everything. Um, so trigger to trick. Um, and if I forget anything, I'll, it'll come up because you know, uh, something won't work and I'll eventually figure out, oh, that's why it's not working because I forgot something. Uh, let's see, trigger there, um, position somewhere there. Um, Oh, maybe, oh, <laughs> this is what I forget all the time, that it's all next Y mode. Um, I think Samir here is probably fine. And, uh, oh, I think the last time I did it with a square wave, I had to do a fairly low frequency. So I'll, uh, so I'll put this to go here. Um, let's see. Oh, I, not putting any amplitude in it, that's why. Right. So, some amplitude. Um, let's see, oh, it's on ground, that's also why, right. okay. Yeah, okay, that's beginning to look more reasonable. Um, All right, so that's the square wave. And uh, the ground is technically, so it's not, I think the last time I did it in the simulation, I put it in the offset so that um, when it's at the lower voltage, that lower voltage is actually ground. And the thing is, you don't actually need that. So I'm not gonna do that. It's more hassle in setting it up. So I won't, I'm, I don't really need it. So I won't bother with it. So I need to put that signal into this. And um, I guess I'm, you know, inductance, I'm gonna leave it at 10 millihenry because that's around the range of the value of inductance I have. 50, 100 millihenry, I don't have those. So I'm not gonna go up to those. Um, I'll mess with the capacitance and the resistance if I have to. So I guess um, I want to measure voltage across the register. That's going to give me something that, uh, um, something that's a, a, a representation of the current that's going through the circuit. 
Wait, is that what I want? Yeah, I, I think that's fine. It'll be enough to show ringing. Um, so let's see here. Oh, I need to bring up the position. And this needs to be on DC, yeah. Okay, so I, it's enough that I can see the ringing. And I guess I want it on a, actually a bit of a faster time scale because it's dying down rather quickly. Um, so let's see here, one kilohertz, is that too fast? Too fast. Um, so I'll try to go up to maybe 500 hertz instead of uh, one kilohertz. And I think this is on too small a scale. Let me put it uh, around there since right. So I need to do the fine frequency adjustment to, and so I'll measure the frequency using the oscilloscope since it doesn't actually tell me what the, um, okay, something like this. Uh, let me just do the slightly lower frequency. So, uh, let me do eight divisions so that it's nice and even. Um, one, two, three, four, yeah, about eight divisions. And that's a 0.5 millisecond per division. So it's a four, um, four millisecond for the period. So that should be 250 hertz or so. So, so that's the ringing signal uh, that you get with the uh, um, with with the RLC circuit, <laughs> and uh, uh, now we'll try to build that and see if we get the same ringing thing, or well, we'll yeah yeah. Well, let me just leave it there. So I need to first to collect the components. I need so let me um, go to this overhead view where I can show you the stuff most easily. Um, I believe, so, you know, I have these four inductors um, and uh, my memory is that, you know what, I actually don't remember. Let, but let me start out with this inductor. I think it has a pretty good chance of uh, uh, being something close to 10 millihenry. Let me measure it and see if it's uh, anywhere near 10 millihenry. Um, so, let me just move that a little bit all to the side. So this one here is what I'm measuring. Uh, I need to put this on the correct mode for inductor measurement. And um, so in each of the modes, you see one measurement and another one up on the top. And that's because when you have anything like a real inductor, it will always have uh, two different parameters that Matter. One is inductance, which is, you know, seven millihenry, and it'll have some resistance because it's made with a real wire and, uh, and it, um, so it'll, so, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just messing with some <laughs> windows on my computer that's distracting me. Um, so, so I just need to keep in mind that my inductor is, has some resistance there. But I think the good thing will be it's uh, um, one ohm. And when I put in the 50 ohm register in the circuit, it's going to be, um, so you know, 50 ohm register in the circuit, it, it's going to be uh, comparable to that, or the one ohm is going to be much smaller than the 50 ohm. So the fact that my inductor has some resistance it should be fine. It shouldn't affect the result too much. So that seven, that's probably the closest I'm gonna get. Let me just try the um, other inductor with more turns to see if it's uh, closer to 10 or farther from 10. It's definitely um, larger than 10. I don't know how much larger. It's mainly why I wanna try measuring it. So, Uh, yeah, 40 millihenry. <laughs> so, so let me go with this uh, uh, this one, the one that I measured before this. I'm gonna put away the other three that I'm not using. So this has, again, just to confirm, this inductance of about seven millihenry. So we'll 
Um, so that should uh, give us uh, something that's uh, comparable to what we saw in the simulation. Okay. Um, so, all right, I gotta build a circuit. And uh, in fact, I'll, I'll leave that uh, meter there since uh, I'll most likely need to capacitance the values. So I, um, so, so let me just put aside the component there. And I'm gonna need the uh, capacitance of 100 nanofarad or 0.1 microfarad. I think I have that exactly. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, 0.1 microfarad exactly. Um, at least that's what the drawer says. So now I'm gonna measure it to see if uh, it lives up to the promise. Um, yeah, 75. It concerns me a little that they're both on the lower side. Let me try to uh, go through a few until I find the one that's closer to 0.1. Because uh, I think the, the differences between those two, they are probably going to add up to be like a 50% error. And I'd like to kind of average it out. Um, Because the, here the parameter that matters is L times C. So uh, are they all gonna be smaller? I mean, sometimes, you know, these come in batches. So if the batch I got here is all on the lower side of 0.1, it, there's a possibility that, yeah. let me just grab a few more and see if they go. Actually, I got this weird looking. Is that even gonna plug in? I don't know if it'll plug in. This weird looking thing, uh, it's a capacitor. It was in the same drawer, but uh, obviously different type. Um, oh wait, that's worse. Um, let's see, do I have something that's a... Uh... Oh, wait, wait, I, uh, this is a different uh, drawer that also has 0.1 labeled. So there's a chance that this will be closer to 0.1. So let me try this one. So I'm not even gonna try to read the small letters on this thing, but what I am going to do is, is measure it. All right, I think that's close enough. Let me just do one more. And if that doesn't get any closer than 86, I'll just go with that. Yeah, 89. Okay, that's close enough. So this is the capacitor I'm gonna use. And I need a 50 ohm resistance um, register. So let's see here. I got 56 ohm here, which, oops, uh, I'm not gonna use the big register. They probably won't even fit. Um, let me try to get at the smaller one. The bigger ones are rated for higher power, but it's, Kind of too absurdly large. I don't actually need um, one watt register. So this is the smaller one. It should be 50, something around the 56 ohm. So let's see. Oh wait, I need to change this to register mode. Um, yeah, that's close enough, 63. So, all right, let me put this in and um, see what we get. I'm just gonna carefully put away all these other components that we are not using and I'll sort out the my red capacitors later. So I need, um, so if you are looking at the simulation, I need uh, regist the inductor, capacitor and the register in series. And I'm just gonna measure, yeah, yeah, so. Um, let me put them in series here. So in doctor first, I hope this, yeah, the wire's not too thin. I, I'm feeling a little bit of a resistance as I'm plugging in the wire, which hopefully means the wire 
is making good electrical contact with the things in the breadboard. Breadboard imposes a bit of a, a limitation on, um, on <laughs> what size wire can fit into it. So the, this capacitor is really the right size. This uh, register is probably a little bit too thick, um, but I think it it will go in. Um, okay. So between these three, so these three elements are in series. Um, they are all uh, connected. Uh, they have a uh, you know, junction between capaci capacitor and register, junction between uh, inductor and capacitor, and no other connection anywhere. So uh, when I put in the signal, I want the ground to be on the side of the register so that I can measure the voltage across the register. And I want the, the signal lead to go on the other side of the inductor so that the whole, the signal when I apply it, it goes up over the whole, uh, whole series circuit. So let's see here. Yeah, let me move this back so that you can see the settings on the oscilloscope as I change some of them. Um, yeah, so, it, well, here's my signal wire. This is the one from the um, from the function generator there. I'm putting it across the, the whole circuit with the ground lead next to the register. and the other lead uh, going to the one to the And uh, this time I'm not going to bother connecting the ground for the, um, uh, bother connecting the ground for the oscilloscope because they're just gonna be connected to each other. It just gets in the way. So I'm not gonna connect it. I, it, it is already connected. When I connect it, it does nothing. And uh, the positive lead goes uh, on the other side of the register. All right, that kind of does it. Um, so I should run the signal at 250 hertz. That's what the other one was is at. So you should go somewhere around 250 hertz. Uh, yeah, something like that. I guess it's a, a little bit disappointing. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I guess. Was that really 250 hertz? All right, uh, let's see how they compare. Uh, by the way, so I'm gonna turn off the input signal because that's where you see a lot of uh, imperfection that not, that we can do anything about. <laughs> so when I just turned it off so that you don't see it at all. Because um, it, it and well, so, um, so that's what it looks like. It, um, I, so you know, there are places where it falls a little bit short. As in, I guess if you are, you can count maybe um, um, number of oscillations that you are able to see. And when you look at that, let me just move this over here. So before signal dies down completely on this real or you know dies down small enough, you count one, two, three, four, five, maybe six bumps, um, counting both the 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 peaks and valleys. And uh, on the um, uh, I guess on the downside of this. Part I said one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, maybe it's pretty close. Yeah, and I, and I think the a lot of the difference can be explained by the differences in resistance. In fact, if I increase the resistance here, you can see that it um, the amount of bumps you can have before it dies down um, does go down. So, so yeah, the we got the ring circuit with the. Um, we got the ringing circuit with uh, the uh, real circuit as well as with the uh, with the, the ringing circuit similar to the simulation with the real circuit. 
Um, I want to make this a little bit better. Uh, one way to, let's see, can I do this? Um, so I think if I measure voltage across the inductor, so the inductor already has something like, uh, it already has something like a, a, a one, two ohm resistance. So, well, I guess with that, the fact that it has resistance itself doesn't matter. Um, well, this is what I want to try. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, let me uh, set up the simulation this way so that we have something comparable. So in the simulation, uh, it's no trouble. I can simply measure the, uh, the voltage across the capacitor. So now when you do that, you do have to be mindful that um, the offset will change with the voltage. So, you know, you have to look for that offset change. And with the real circuit, what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to get rid of the register entirely. So even if I don't include the register in here at all, so it's still going to be technically an RLC circuit. There is a resistance in the inductor. The only difference is that it's now a significant resistance, significant resistance of about one ohm. But one ohm is a lot smaller than the 50 ohm that we had to put in earlier. So we are going to get different behavior. And let's see what that looks like. So, um, so I'm applying it this way. And let me measure the voltage on the other side of the capacitor. Just need a lead because that leg isn't quite long enough for me to grab onto. So put this here, connect it on the other side. Again, the ground lead doesn't really need to be connected. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. That's what it looks like. It um, oscillates for quite a bit longer and or let me turn off the input channel so that, oh, wait. Uh, yeah, so input, no input. So that's the output uh, channel. It uh, oscillates quite a bit longer. That, um, so I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe 11 months. So um, yeah, I, I guess what I'm demonstrating here is that um, if you look at the ringing as um, something having to do with energy dissipation, then what you are seeing here is that the, the in this series of RLC circuit, the register here dissipates away energy. So that's why in the simulation, you see that when I increase the resistance, that the ringing dies down more quickly. And you see that in real circuit too. Uh, when I get rid of the register entirely, although not 100% because the inductor has its own resistance, then you see the ringing last longer. So I think that's all the demonstration of the exact same circuit you've seen before. And one thing I wanted to do was actually, so before we, uh, I only demonstrated a time varying circuit. I didn't do any AC circuit stuff because with the square wave, I'm all I'm doing is basically apply a sudden impulse and see the circuit to response. What I want to uh, want you to see is uh, AC circuit. So with the AC circuit, you need to have a sinusoidally driven um, thing. And let me see if I can demonstrate something here. Um, maybe I can do it with Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, let's see. I, I think uh, one thing I can demonstrate in simulation now and also in the circuit is this. So I can match, so I'm still applying the same signal and all, and I'm gonna measure the voltage across the register. This way, what I measure will be a, a, a representation of current. This is something that's proportional to the current. And what you see now is that the place where the voltage peaks, 
that my applied signal input is different from the, the time when the current peaks. And this is what, um, what chapter 15 refers to as the phase factor or phase shift. And you'll have some more questions on that too. And uh, I guess what I can, one thing I can demonstrate now that's relatively easy is how this phase shift changes with the applied signal frequency. And I don't quite, let's see, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> so the current is currently lagging the voltage and I'm trying to remember if that means um, by, so my resonance frequency might be lower. This is one of those things where you just gotta try. L let me just change the frequency. Uh, let's see. So when I go to higher frequency, yeah. Okay, so my current uh, uh, frequency that I'm at right now, 250 Hertz, it's lower than what uh, what is the circuit to resonance of frequency. So let me increase the frequency. And as I do that, you see the this uh, output voltage go up. Uh, yeah, and in fact, I need to change the scale back so that I can actually show the signal. Um, let's see, do I need to? Oh, okay, I need to change my frequency entirely. Uh, yeah, and I need to change it some more. Okay, um, yeah, so I think I passed the resonance there. So let me go do that, okay. So, all right, so, Yeah, so so this is what uh, what's called the, the uh, RLC circuit resonance. The the amount of current that's flowing through the circuit it's frequency dependent. So right now I'm driving the circuit off resonance. So there's some amount of current flowing through, not that much. And as I near the resonance, what you see is that the the current flowing through the circuit uh, increases. And there's a point where it uh, reaches a maximum. And you should see, oh, I guess, um, uh, yeah. Because the way this is connected, it's uh, inverted. So let me invert the channel <laughs> so that it doesn't <laughs> confuse me. Um, because this is what you should see. Um, so as it reaches resonance, so, okay. So the phase shift that you saw was reverse the sign. So current was, uh, I think this is lagging, whatever. Current was on this side of the voltage. And as it goes through, through the resonance, you will see the peak go to the other side of voltage. So yeah, so let me, so around here is where it reaches resonance. So let me go to higher voltage so that I can show it. To, uh, higher voltage here so that it's not so imposing. Okay, so yeah, so this is the resonance. I'm just gonna click a few times. So this is on one side of resonance. And the current is now getting some over and let me go to higher frequency. As I go to higher frequency, what you see is that the current increases, increases until it reaches a maximum here. And then as I go to even higher frequency, the current actually decreases. So that's resonance. And one interesting thing you see is that on resonance, you see that the, um, the phase of the current and the voltage match up. They have the same phase. Uh, when the voltage is at maximum, current is at maximum. And um, in fact, if you calculate this value, it should be the applied voltage divided by the resistance. So what I want to demonstrate, I think it'll maybe take 10 minutes, is um, show the, this uh, resonance with the real circuit. I'll use the same, well, I'll, you know, let me just use the, all the same components. I'm just going to bring this 50 ohm register back and, um, and, and that'll give us the resonant RLC circuit. Um, so, Sorry, I'm hiccuping for some reason. Just need to stop talking for a little bit and calm my diaphragm. Um, okay. All right, so I'm just gonna plug this 50 ohm register back in. I fortunately I didn't take out any capacitor or anything. 
and I'm gonna get ready to measure the voltage across the register as a measure of um, the current and the voltage here needs to be applied here. Okay, so it's um, um, driven, so yeah, the RS circuit with the, um, is, and what I need, so uh, what I need to change now is I need to, I need to change the driving signal into the uh, sinusoidal signal. And um, with the sinusoidal signal, you see that the, the imperfections that I had before are gone because the this imperfection, it mostly has to do with this sudden change that I'm trying to drive. So when I'm not trying to do that anymore, I'm driving with a gentle sinusoidal signal, it behaves much more ideally. So. And when you're working with the AC signal, you will um, almost always be using just the sinusoidal signal. So yeah, and the output, the current that's going through the circuit, I do have something there, but it's a very, very tiny. It's a, uh, it's a, yeah. well, yeah, it, the, this uh, channel one is right now on the smallest scale. I think that's a five millivolts per division. So um, I think the resonance frequency was at higher end. So as I increase the frequency, what you see is that you see that that uh, current amplitude is going up. Oh, wait, I reached my limit there. Let me go to the other one. And let me go start at around the 500 Hertz. Okay. So as I increase the frequency, the current is increasing. So let me change my scale here so that I can continue to display it. Increase the frequency, increase the frequency, increase the frequency. Um, oh, I'm still, wait, okay. Yeah, I still need to, increase. so I'm gonna go up one more decade and then um, come back down to five kilohertz range so that I can, uh, properly go through the, okay, yeah. So I'm near the resonance here. Let me go through that. So uh, so I need to go to smaller scale here. And now as I increase the frequency here, so there's a point where uh, the, the voltage and current are in sync. They have the same phase. And that's also where, so let me turn off the, uh, let me turn off the input voltage so that no more voltage. All you're seeing here is the current and the current goes through the maximum here, here. And the point where it goes through the maximum is where they are in sync. Uh, lower than the frequency, it was, um, current was, I don't know, leading the voltage or whatever. And after that frequency, the current is lagging the voltage. Uh, I, I always get those mixed up, leading and lagging. So I uh, could have <laughs> said it the other way around. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's, uh, Kind of what you get. Let me try to put these two in the same uh, scale. So the input voltage at, um, I guess, is this, I'm just putting this down to five, mil, five volts per um, division scale. And I'm gonna just to increase the input until it kind of matches that. Wait, can I do that? Yeah. yeah, yeah until it kind of matches five, uh, what I see on the simulation. So this is what I'm trying to get. Let me just show the simulation here. And what I'm now trying to do is just to uh, match my <laughs> parameters of the input until my input kind of looks similar to the simulation input. So something like that, about that much of the screen. And on the simulation, the output is on one volt per division scale. So then, me, oh wait, it's not the, am I? Let me turn off the output that was confusing me. Okay, um, so somewhere around the here. So that's the, uh, that's the input. And <laughs> let me turn off the input and that's the, um, yeah, got both of the signals. Let me put this on one millivolt. Per, I mean, one volt per division. Um, 
Hmm. I don't know if this uh, matches up the way they are supposed to. Oh, um, that's too much. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the the this thing is struggling to drive a so, such a high voltage through the thing. So let me do it this way. I'm going to decrease it. Let me just put this on one volt per division so that I can put in a more reasonable amount of uh, volts. Um, so input is at one volt per division. This is showing something like a four volts peak to peak. And I'm going to do something similar for the simulation. I'm just going to, uh, so a one volt per division. Let me just uh, decrease the amplitude until it's about four volts peak to peak. Okay. And um, so dual, okay. So both the input and output are at one volt per division and that's what's showing. Um, um, I don't know if that sounds right. Um, in any case, <laughs> let me um, turn both of those, these on, and they are both on one volt per division. And let me put this on resonance again. Oh, I guess that's right. Um, somehow I was expecting all of the applied voltage to be on resistor. Um, Mm, something's not quite matching the expectation here. Although the, I mean, what, what I say with the real thing somehow matches uh, wonderfully well with the simulation. Um, but um, what am I missing? Um, so on resonance, um, it should be that the impedance of the inductor and capacitor actually cancels out. So, um, I, I mean, that's why the maximum current is um, V in over R. What am I missing here? Um, let's see. Mm. I'm trying to think <laughs> what it is that I'm not thinking. Because, um, I mean, the, in the experiment, it works fine. <laughs> and somehow the simulation matches. So I, I don't think uh, simulation is doing something that's wrong. I, it's just that uh, it wasn't quite uh, matching what I was expecting it to do. Um, why is it different to biofit? I mean, uh, let me just try this just to, yeah, somehow. On resonance, the value of the resistance should have met. Oh, you know what? I think I know what it is. Um, this is simulation, which is wonderfully, it's a simulating the, uh, simulating the output impedance of the, of the function generator. So uh, 50 ohm is the standard output impedance of uh, uh, a lot of instruments. So even though in the circuit you have 50 ohm resistor, what, what, you, um, what your real circuit actually has is another 50 ohm resistor across this connection here. And um, so, or uh, another thing, not, not across where I was pointing it, but there's a, um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this says output impedance of 50 ohm, that's, uh, that actually does explain this factor of a half. So if this register is higher, uh, which makes the output impedance of the, the function generator less relevant, then the output signal matches the input signal more. So, so let me just uh, confirm that with the real circuit here by replacing my 50 ohm register with a 500 ohm register which I don't really have, but I do have a 750 ohm register. So let me do with that and that should give me something that's uh, pretty close. Oh. Let me go to the 
overhead thing. So this is my, uh, uh, what so it's coming out of a box that's labeled the 750. Either way, I'm gonna measure it so it doesn't actually matter what it is. I mean, what the box is labeled. It matters what the register is, and I'm gonna measure it so that I know what it is. Um, okay, so seven something, seven sixty-seven, but out of 750 box. So let me replace that register with, or use that to replace the 50 ohm register. And yeah, and uh, what I get matches what it <laughs> should look like. So, and let me just go through the resonance again to show. Uh, oops. So yeah, so that's on the higher frequency side of the resonance, and on the lower frequency side, this is what it. Why does it? Oh, I guess that's the lowest I can go. It doesn't go any lower. Um, so. Yeah. So yeah, that uh, <laughs> that explains it. So um, so yeah. And so um, so e even in the lecture, we haven't quite gotten to. Uh, oops. Um, we haven't quite gotten to the AC circuitry yet. So, uh, I, um, but I think what I'm hoping you can do is uh, you can at least uh, see some uh, aspect of AC circuit. And I think this simulation is pretty good for giving you that um, realistic experience for what that looks like because it um, simulates enough components of a real experiment. And, um, and I'll also have a set of instruction for using the, the other simulation, the FET simulation, uh, where it's less realistic, but it's more versatile in terms of the circuit you can try. So I think that's uh, probably it. Um, let me well, let me go back to the announcement to, to see. So, oh, you know, I almost forgot. Illustrate the limitations of oscilloscope AC mode. Um, so, so let me end this meeting with that. So I demonstrate the same circuits that we did the last time and did one more um, AC circuit so that um, you've seen some illustration of AC circuit. And let me do the uh, illustrating the limitations of the oscilloscope AC mode. Um, so, so I was careful to use the, um, so, let me get rid of the simulation. And this is actually the one thing the simulation doesn't simulate um, to my chagrin. Uh, so, um, so I've been careful to use only the DC mode, even when my so DC mode here, even when my uh, even when my signal is clearly AC, and there is a reason for that. It's uh, that the it's that the AC mode necessarily introduces a distortion of a sort. So I want to show, let's see here. So for this demonstration, I don't really need a circuit. I'm just going to go directly from the function generator to the oscilloscope uh, in two different ways. So one of them will go to DC mode channel so that it just displays DC. And the other ten, so the, the, well, a copy of the signal will go to the AC mode input so that you can see the distortion that's introduced by AC mode. So I have that, that's a channel B showing right now. Let me uh, replace the connection here with just a copy of the same uh, input from the oscilloscope. So they should look identical. Uh, uh, let, me, let me do it this way. I'm gonna, um, oh. Well, they should look identical. I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna uh, use the oscilloscope like a split screen. I'll, uh, well, let me first zoom into the oscilloscope a little bit more. Uh, I will, so, well, I'll just read off the frequency. Um, you'll just have to trust me that I, oops, I'm sorry, yeah. You also said to trust me that I'm reading off the correct frequency when I say um, the function generator is outputting some kind of frequency. 
And what I want to use this oscilloscope as right now is um, I want to use the top half to display one thing and the bottom half to display another. I can do it this way. So I just grounded the channel B and I'm moving the position of channel B up so that it's centered around the you know, first quarter. So that'll, that top half will be showing me the channel B signal and the bottom half will be showing me the channel one signal and or channel A. So channel B, I will leave it on, um, I guess you, I'll, I, I'm leaving it on ground mode and I'm going to, oh, I think if I move this a little bit, yeah, so channel A, the only one that you can see, I'll put move this to AC mode so that you can see the difference between AC mode and DC mode. And the way it's shown right now, you don't really see a difference. It looks the same. You know, as I change the frequency, those two don't re look really different. So you might, uh, right, right. Uh, so you might think, okay, AC mode, DC mode, they are the same. I can use both, and AC mode is actually, um, in some ways, more convenient. Like you can imagine a signal introducing a, there being an offset to your signal, and when I let me just turn on DC offset, and when I introduce a DC offset, my channel B signal it's uh, moving according to that offset, but channel A kind of stays centered. So there's a, a reasons to use AC mode sometimes. It can be more convenient that way. But what you need to be aware of are distortions that the AC mode can introduce. Um, it tends to happen at lower frequencies. So this is something that you do worry about when you are at lower frequency. So let me go, see is that low enough? Maybe now you might think, hey, I, I'm at 50 Hertz. That's pretty low and I still don't see any distortions. Um, well, let me, let me put in a signal that before was showing a lot more distortion. So right now I'm doing sinusoidal signal. Sinusoidal signs are nice for a lot of different things to handle. Let me switch this to square signal. So with the square signal, that's where you begin to see the distortion that AC mode introduces. Again, okay? this is channel B, no distortion, just the square that's coming in. And this is channel A. Um, what I'm putting in is a square sign, square um, signal, and it's not, that's not what it's display. And if I go into even lower frequency, then I think I, I hope you begin to notice, uh, recognize the shape of the distorted signal. So I was at 50 before, right now I'm going, oh, I need to go lower. Okay, so let me put this as something around the 10 Hertz. So right now the fun uh, function generator is reading exactly 10 Hertz. And uh, this is the signal that you are seeing. So um, again, this is the channel B, just the square wave, still looks squarish. And this is channel A. Um, and I hope you recognize it as a kind of an RC circuit type signal where the, um, it, there's a, some kind of capacitor charging up and discharging. And, and that is a kind of how the AC mode works. There's a capacitor in there. That's a, that capacitor is what's being used to take out the DC offsets and Presence of the capacitor important for the functioning of the AC mode. It also will distort the signals at lower frequencies. Uh, it's not just the DC that gets filtered out, it's DC and a little bit above. So at 10 Hertz, you can see a fairly substantial distortion. And even at 50 Hertz, it was uh, shifting it enough. So, so this gives you a bit of a kind of criteria. So if I go up to, let me go up to 100 Hertz, so at 100 Hertz, it looks like this, okay. It's better, but a bit, um, the distortion is obviously there. Let me go up to a kilohertz. So at one kilohertz, then it's perfectly fine. So if you had a kilohertz signal, then you wouldn't worry about any kind of distortion introduced by um, AC mode, even if you have a square wave. But at 100 Hertz, so, this is again back at 100 Hertz. 
So if you had a sine wave signal, then you wouldn't worry. But at 100 hertz, you have enough of a low frequency signal here that the distortion is going to start to matter. So uh, I wonder where you do say it's good enough. Uh, I don't know. So, so uh, I guess the 500 hertz square wave, you don't quite see it. But so it's that distortion that um, that you have to be mindful of. So, um, so, so it's that limitation of the AC mode that I want you to demonstrate. So that for those of you who might work with oscilloscopes, maybe you are majoring in engineering or you're majoring in physics, then you would definitely oscilloscope comes in. It's a tool um, tool of the trade. It, it, unless you never work with electronics ever again, you'll likely see it. And I want to make sure that um, you see something that you would have seen in face-to-face -face lab. And this is the best way I can demonstrate it because even the simulation doesn't quite simulate this limitation of oscilloscope. It um, assumes that you have some magical AC mode that doesn't, <laughs> that, that filters out the DC offset but doesn't introduce any of these distortions. So. Um, so I think that's uh, everything. Let me just uh, go back to the uh, share the screen to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And um, and I'll, uh, assuming I didn't miss anything, I'll end the session here. Uh, yeah, illustrate the limitation to, of oscilloscope AC mode. And we've been online for two hours. I think uh, I don't, unless there are requests, I still have my <laughs> real time audience. <laughs> If you have any requests for additional time dependent and AC circuits, the time to request that is now. And we have, we do have one more online lab session. So uh, I haven't quite decided what to do at the next lab session, but um, if there are some circuits that people want to see demonstrated, then we, I can probably do that. So not seeing any requests. Oh wait, I might see some requests. Yeah, okay, not seeing any request. <laughs> I'll end the session here. Let me start the recording and uh, I'll remain briefly online for my remaining real-time audience. So goodbye to people who are joining my recorded video. <laughs>